Welcome to the Latter-day Contemplation Presents Come Follow Me podcast. I'm your co-host, Abdul Haq, also known as Christopher Hurtado. I'm also co-host of the Latter-day Peace Studies Presents Come Follow Me and Latter-day Contemplation podcasts. In this podcast, I'm joined by my co-host and Sufi master, Sufi Al-Hajj Daoud, also known as Dr. David Peck. Dr. Peck is also the host of the Of Saints and Sufis, Musings of a Mormon Mystic podcast. On this podcast, we're sharing an actual master-disciple dialogue on scripture with little to no editing. I'm your co-host, Sufi Al-Hajj Daoud, also known as Dr. David Peck. The Sufi path is a spiritual, mystical, and contemplative practice often described as a journey. Universal Sufism is not a religion. Rather, universal Sufism is a spiritual path that welcomes persons of all religions or no religion at all. Our path is open to all, welcomes all, loves all. Sufi scripture study begins with a de-educational process that speaks directly to the souls of saints and Sufis and their scriptures. This study sets aside mere ethical or doctrinal readings through what Sufis call unlearning. This Sufi mystical approach enables one to see the scriptures afresh through spiritual eyes. We invite you to join our unfolding dialogue. Let the journey begin. Abdul Haq, welcome back. We're going to have uh, our second episode today of Latter-day Contemplation, Come Follow Me. And uh, we're going to enter into our weekly reading assignment, which is uh, 1 Corinthians chapters 8 through 14. And this week, I asked you if, if you would like to select the verses that we're going to focus on in our conversation today. So what did you come up with? Yes, it's good to be with you, Sheikh. You know, the first thing that happened to me, just as you said it would, when I finished my last conversation with you, I went over to do the reading for this week so that I could podcast with Ben. That's Latter-day Peace Studies Presents, Come Follow Me. And I didn't get very far before what you said would happen happened, which is I would read differently after our last discussion. And I would see that the same thing that we talked about, I would see it again. And it came up right away in the first three verses. So I'm going to read those verses from the King James Version. So I just want to really quickly just make sure I understand. So within the first three verses, yes. it, it, it happened. In other words, I gave you this assignment, go find something. And you made it three verses before you knew what you wanted to talk about. So tell us what they are again and go ahead and read them in King James. Okay. This is 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through 3. Now as touching things offered unto idols... We know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. And if a man think he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing, yet as he ought to know. But if man love God, but if any man love God, the same is known of him. Okay, so before we go on to maybe terms to unlearn, I just thought maybe I could take a minute and point out things that for me are part of the confusion that can occur in trying to read something like Paul in, um, in the King James Version. For example, um, when we come to knoweth anything, the words are separated, right? In verse 2, if, and if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing. And, 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 and as a Sufi, I'd probably say, well, why not separate no thing? Right. In other words, so there's sometimes when we look at that and when it says in verse three, but if any man love God, the same is known of him. I'm going, well, who's the him? Is it the man knowing himself because he loves God or is it is that him God? And so sometimes as I read this, uh, I, I don't know what pronoun is pointing to what antecedent. Right. What what other noun? But anyway, we can I want to talk about that. But but. At some point, I'm just saying it's kind of difficult to read this. So you go ahead and tell us now what the terms are you would you think we ought to focus on for unlearning. Well, first, I have to admit, verse three is unclear for the reason you stated, right? There is that problem with the pronoun. So I think, you know, here, when I look at these words, it's charity as it's as it's uh, translated in the King James Version. And then knowledge, right? Knowing. I think those are the two key terms here. When it comes to when it comes to knowing, when it comes to charity, what are these things? What can we call knowledge? What is charity? Good, good. And we we often in our 
discussions will, you know, say we already know these terms. So what would be your, you know, uh, the response you would probably typically give in um, a scriptural discussion setting of charity? Sure. You know, in an LDS scripture study discussion, right, you're going to have that charity is the pure love of Christ. So this is a particular special kind of love that I almost wanted to say, you know, that only Christ has, but the idea is we're supposed to have it too, right? But it is this particular special kind of love that's different from all other kinds of love somehow. And then knowledge, this one's, I'm not the best one to answer this question because I'm a philosopher. So I'll try to think uh, how would, you know, the, the average Latter-day Saint answer it. I don't know. I think, you know, the idea is, I think if we talk about, if you think you know something, it turns out, you know, nothing, this is more like, and this is probably what made me, what caught my attention, right? When, after our last discussion is this idea that, that you could know something or think, you know, something and not actually know something. So I think, you know, in an, in an average Latter-day Saint discussion, this would be something like the things of God are higher than the things of, of humans and you can't understand his things and something like that. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that uh, you're hitting on a lot of things that I hear and have grown up with. Um, you know, my, my entire life I've, I've been a, a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And uh, so I've, I remember this in primary lessons at Sunday school and, and uh, the idea of, so if we say, well, charity is the pure love of Christ, which I believe comes from the book of Moroni, then uh, my other question is, well, what's the pure love of Christ? Because I feel like I haven't answered anything. I'm going, well, yeah, but what is that? Yeah, I came to the Latter-day Saint tradition at age 11. And my experience, even as a Latter-day Saint in Venezuela, is that chapter 13 of First Corinthians is about love, amor, right? There, that's that was the translation, love, uh, just like the Latin amor, right? So, I don't, I didn't understand where this came from, and I didn't know this. What you just said that it comes from Moroni, and now I get it. Okay, the definition is taken from Moroni and inserted into the Bible, and this is a, con a Latter Day Saint concept, right? That the somehow the, the 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 Book of Mormon is the key to reading the Bible, right? right. Much like Hadith tells us how to read Quran or something like that in Islamic Correct. tradition. Correct. Yeah, it's an interpretive uh, um, trope or, or uh, well, the technical term would probably be some kind of hermeneutic. Right. Right, which is a, a way we, we employ a method by which we employ uh, rules or other texts to, to understand what we're reading. And there's, of course, nothing wrong with that at all. I'm not suggesting there is. My problem is, is that, but if I don't know what the Book of Mormon is saying, then where do I go from there? So if I read 1 Corinthians 13 about charity, or uh, 1 Corinthians 8, 1 about charity, and I say, well, yeah, the Book of Mormon teaches us that's the pure love of Christ, then I go, well, what is the pure love of Christ? Because to me, it has a sort of, it's not tautological, meaning cir purely circular, but I'm left in ignorance. There's something else I see here. As I look at verse 3 again, you know, if I'm just this, I'm avering a guess because there is this pronoun problem, right? I wonder, my, my feeling is, I'm not looking, the grammar doesn't help me. If I look at the grammar, it's just confusing. But my sense is that if I love God, then I can know God. That's uh -huh. my sense. But let's, you, uh -huh. you have another translation yeah. we can look at. Yeah, we're going to do that too. I just wanted to pause on knowledge, which is uh, just one, one other comment. That there's an issue with the English language when we say knowledge which is we, we essentially have one way of, uh, that we go to when we say, well, to know something, it encompasses several kinds of knowledge that would have separate terms or words in another language. Okay. Right? So you talked about Spanish. You would have, you know, uh, the, the idea of, uh, um, of loving as in uh, amar, right, that we, we love um, in, in that sense. But then there's also, or excuse me, that's knowing, uh, saber, and conocer in Spanish, right? One, one would be more like a, a knowledge of facts and or of descriptors or of relationships, like you know, where's the moon vis-a-vis -vis the earth? Well, it's so many hundreds of thousands of miles or kilometers or whatever we have. Uh, and what is the capital of Nevada? Everybody thinks it's Las Vegas, but it's Carson City. Uh, those are kind of just 
those are things we made up, that's conventional knowledge. We call this thing the moon. We could have called it whatever, Garvarg, but we called it the moon. And, and so we, we, that's our made up. But conocer is different. And maybe we can chat about, what does it mean to know God? You brought that back up. I think it's very important when we say we know God. Yeah, you know, if I say I know, let's not use God. Let's say I know David. Right? You're David. If I say I know David, somebody can ask me, you mean you know him, right? <laughs> this is conocer, right? Because you can know David. Oh, there's a guy named David. There, there's a man out there whose name is David, right? And then there's I know David, right? We, we're friends, or at least we're acquaintances, right? And this is conocer. And, and to be a friend of God, I think that's probably what we're getting at here. Right, to actually know God yes. in, as, as an intimate friend. Correct, yeah. correct. And, and often that's very hard to describe because the knowledge you have is the knowledge from experience, not necessarily the knowledge from uh, anything that could be written down or understood externally. It may be, but, uh, but often you would say, well, I know God. Often when I hear LDS testimonies, they're saying I know God because he helped me find something that I'd lost mm. or he helped me understand the death of my, my mother. Uh, rather than I know God because he has a tangible body. That would, to me, be more saber, but I know God because he answered my prayer, and I felt that that's more conocer. Yeah, I get that. So I, I can hear a testimony sound something like, I know God lives, or I know God exists, or I know God is working in my life because of these evidences I see, whereas the other conversation would be, I know God, uh, he has a body, and uh, he lives on a planet called Kolob, or something like that, mm -hmm. right? Right, right, right. Which in which in Hebrews eleven verse one, it's it's going to tell us that that uh, faith is the substance of things hoped for. So it's, it's its substance is this thing we call hope, and it is the evidence of things not seen. And so knowledge leading unto faith, Paul seems. If Paul is the author of Hebrews, of course, but Paul seems to be telling us then uh, that we can't. It's of things we can't see, of feelings or emotions or insights or even dreams or visions or uh, that sort of thing. And so, good. I just wanted to point that out. You know, uh, years ago, uh, almost in another lifetime, I studied some Latin, and one of our assignments was to read the book of John in from the gospel uh, in, in the Vulgate. Okay. And I remember coming to the scripture, this eternal life, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. But to know thee was, I, I, I'm going to probably murder this word, so please forgive me, anybody out there that's listening to me. I think it was cognoscare, right? That, that haec autem est vitae terren ut te cognoscant. That's conocer. It's that, so when we translate to English and we say that they might know thee, we lose that whole sense that it's, it's a particular verb that's underlying that word to know. So we need to be aware of that. Yeah, you know, it occurs to me that our word um, cognizant comes from cognoscere. I don't know if that does anything for us. Yes. Yeah, it does for me. Uh, so if we were to say that you are, uh, this is life eternal, that they might have knowledge of thee by being cognizant of thee, uh, uh, of, and of Jesus Christ whom you've said, the one eternal God in Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. And so that probably would be a different thing. And of course, then we have to deal with whoever the particular translator of that verse was, whether it's Tyndall or some later translator in the King James Version, what they meant by no. And of course, these people were grounded in, in Greek and Hebrew and Latin or whatever. And so they, they probably have those ideas of to know behind them before they translate it into the English. So leaving that aside then, I think it's important that we realize that for me, uh, English is kind of a flat language at times uh, scripturally. It, when we translate into English, we sometimes strip away the nuance or the intention of an original source. And I think the, word, the words knowledge and knowing are good examples of that. It just occurs to me that as you know, that this conversation about cognizant may actually go off in the wrong direction because it has it has a sense of being aware of something. That's more like knowing as in I know there's a man named David. Right. But that's to your point, right? Yeah, it's just, it's just I'm to me I'm making that point. And also that's a discussion we'll reserve for uh, another day when we go through the Sufi notion of God consciousness. Right, which is uh, the levels of awareness that Sufis seek to cultivate um, 
and, and to be cognizant, we would say, well, that's a quality of soul, not a quality of mind. Okay. Okay, and so we'll, we'll get to that another day. I think that's a great discussion. So I want to go to the Peshitta. This is uh, a translation of the Aramaic New Te Testament. The manuscripts for the Aramaic are exceptionally old, and uh, it is going to link us into a Semitic language, meaning the languages that were one time attributed to Shem, which would include Hebrew and Syriac and Babylonian and, and uh, uh, these other languages, and would include Arabic as well. Master, my understanding is the, the Peshitta, this is an English translation, of course, from the Aramaic, but mm -hmm. that the Aramaic is thought by some few scholars to be the original New Testament, but most agree the Greek is the original, and this is a, an right. Aramaic translation of the Greek, and yet it is the language that Jesus speaks. It's not that the language correct. in which the New Testament is written, but it is the language Jesus spoke, and it is, it is uh, Semitic, as you say, so then it could come closer to the Hebrew idea. The Hebrew conceptualizations correct. might be better expressed in Aramaic, and that might come through into the English? Yeah, I think so. My, my hesitation to say the Hebrew idea is that, that somehow when Jesus speaks these things, it's only knowable if you understand what the, he, what the Hebrew idea of something would be. I think Jesus was speaking for himself, so to, right, so to say. So I, I just say, well, this is what is attributed to Jesus. The point I'm going to try to make here is there's two words in the, the uh, Aramaic that I want to point out. Uh, uh, one of them deals with love, and the other one deals with, with the divine or God. So uh, I want to read through this and use those Aramaic terms, because retranslating it back to Jesus' language, I think, makes it different than what we would have known from, from the Greek. Okay, I guess I, where I was coming from is that Jesus, of course, is speaking on his own authority, back to our last conversation about authority, and yet he's knowing and quoting from the Hebrew Scriptures. That's true. And so the concepts come from that tradition. That's his tradition, right? Okay. Unless he's trying to teach them something new. Okay. And so what he is saying is not the Hebrew idea. I think that's the whole point of Matthew chapter 5 when he said, I came not to destroy, but to fulfill. And then he goes on to say, it's said of them of old, but I say unto you. I think what he's doing is he's saying, well, you're sort of, in a loose sense, Hebrew, broadly speaking, Israelite or Jewish, uh, as to the tribe of Judah of his day and, and its leadership, this is what you think from your reading of the law. And I'm going to tell you what I think. So I'm not so sure that Jesus is always, I think he's sometimes saying, don't take this so-called Hebrew view of things. I'm going to give you a new way. I'm going to put new, I don't want to put new wine into an old bottle. Okay. And yet he's using the, he's using, he's speaking his language, Aramaic, which is still related to Hebrew. And we're still getting in Greek, and so maybe there's something to talk about here. Yeah, and you and I are going to uh, talk about some Arabic terms, because Sufis use a lot of Arabic, because uh, the Sufi tradition came through Arabic, Turkic, Persian, Mongolian languages, primarily Arabic. So we're going to talk. We're going to use some Arabic terms, but they're sister languages. Um, now, this this beginning of verse one. But concerning the sacrifices of idols. We know that there is a knowledge in all things, and knowledge puffs up, but chubba builds up. And so when we have the word edify in the king, charity edifieth, edify literally means to build, right? To, 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 it's an edifice. We're, we're restructuring an edifice. So we want to talk about this word chubba, which in Arabic is hub. Yes. Yeah, I saw that. I saw a couple of things right away. So first I see puffs up, builds up. And you lose that. You lose that in the, if you say edify, right? Edify is, right. is, is synonymous with building, but you know, you say knowledge puffs up, chubba builds up. And That's I right. also recognize right away that chubba is not English. It looks like that the term was sort of transliterated from the Aramaic and left and maybe there's a reason, right? That's why, let's not, let's not call this love. Let's say this is something like, again, the Arabic is hub, right? Yep. So, so what they've done in this translation is they've told us what kind of love. Now, Master, my understanding of hub is it just translates love, right? I, I know Arabic and hub is love. Sure. So I, I, I imagine you're going to tell me something more than that here. <laughs> yeah, we're going to get to that here in a second. 
then verse two, so what all I'm pointing out is they, they didn't just say love in that particular area of the verse in this translation into English. They put the, the transliterated Aramaic word in there, chubba, chubba, in order to tell us, now this is a particular kind of love in our tr- translation. Just like we said, there's particular kinds of knowledge. There's a particular kind of love that they're talking. So they didn't want to just say love. They wanted to say, we're going to, now I agree with you. We could say that hub is just love, but I think there's some other ways it can be understood. We'll go into that in a minute. So verse two in the Peshitta, this version of the Peshitta, yet if a man thinks that he knows something, he doesn't yet know something according to what is proper for him to know. In other words, I'm going to say this is as beautiful a statement of Sufi unlearning as I've ever read. Really? Yeah, because how do we start our reading the verses? What are the things you have to unlearn? Meaning those are the things you think you know. Okay. Right? So, So let's read this again. Yet if a man thinks that he knows something, which is the problem with our learning getting in the way of our spiritual scripture reading, we think we already know what these words mean. Okay. There's a so, lot of that in our tradition, right? The idea that I already know what this says. Um, I don't think that we are reading closely, you know, that we, uh, when we do read, of course, there's always a hermeneutic, a lens through which we read, but the hermeneutic seems to be the chapter headings and the chapter headings are not, uh, sure. they're not scripture. Canon. Well, okay. They're, they're, they are scripture because academically speaking, at least, because that's how we read the sacred text but they're not the sacred text itself. That's correct. And so they're only one possible interpretation. Mm-hmm. Yep, or that's someone else's interpolation even of what they think the chapter says. And so if we take the chapter heading to tell us what's in the chapter and we keep that in our mind, then we have set up a particular lens to understand the scriptures and that can interfere with our ability to understand the text for itself, right? With that lens can get in the way. And so part of unlearning is saying, okay, I know I have this lens, but let's see if I can try and set it aside for a little while. Let's see if I can try to revisit this text afresh, right? And I'm going to look at it through um, uh, spiritual eyes uh, with reference to my soul. So um, I have a couple more things to say about that, but go ahead and we'll, we'll come back to that. I just think, you know, this doesn't necessarily mean that I can't read it the way it's spelled out in the chapter headings, right? It's just set that aside and let's read it another way and see what happens. Right. So we learn our our way of understanding it and that way it becomes conocer rather than saber. Okay. Reading it through the chapter headings is is to know as in I know what the authors of the chapter headings think this says. Right. But conocer is when we say I want to I want to bring this scripture in that's the Sufi way. Bring it inside. Let my soul resonate with this a little bit. And let and let, let be the way I understand it. Let that be the way I, I approach it. And so the notion is not that a lens is not valuable, but if we don't know there are lenses and we don't know that we are using these lenses, then we can cut ourselves off from the internal power of the text because we deal with it as an externality that someone has told us already what it means and that's what it means. So let me come back to lenses for just one other thing I wanted to say here very quickly, which is a, lot, a number of times when I'm sitting in some kind of a group discussion, say a Sunday school class or a you know, gospel doctrine class or priesthood uh, or whatever, or, or sometimes even in sacrament meeting, but a lot of times when we're together reading a, a verse of scripture, someone will say, can someone read verse blah? And they'll, they'll read the verse and they'll say, what do people think? And someone will raise their hand and say, well, that's a great apostasy scripture. And I'll go, so your lens is the great apostasy. So that's the only meaning that scripture has. And if I'm bold, and I'm usually not, I usually, I'm trying now more and more just to shut up. But if I, if I would raise my hand, I'd go, that's funny. I thought this scripture was talking about me and my unbelief, me and my testimo- tes- uh, tendency to go astray, me and my, wh- why are you saying this is, uh, you know, it's not just, maybe it is a, a, a scripture that can apply to this meta narrative we've created in the church called the great apostasy. Well, we didn't even create it. It comes from Protestantism and you wrote a chapter in a book repudiating this that the Maxwell Institute would have published, didn't you? And then there's another one that the Maxwell Institute did publish more recently. Yeah, standing apart, uh, 
Mormon Historical Consciousness and the Concept of Apostasy by o Oxford University Press. I wrote the 12th chapter in that, and uh, it's a great book by Miranda Wilcox and John Young that explores uh, uh, this concept of apostasy and how it has, has impacted Mormon historical consciousness, that we tend to read all history as applying to, to the, the uh, great apostasy. So when we read about something that was hard, hard in the Middle Ages, we go, that's because they apostatized. And I'm going, someone living in 13th century France didn't apostatize? They couldn't have left the church because there was no ancient church anymore, according to the theory. You know, it, it becomes this complication whereby we judge everybody in all their times according to this meta narrative. And I'm going, uh, I don't think that's applicable at all. And not only that, but I think it doesn't help us love those people. We're going to do their temple work and we think they were evil or backward or morons or don't consider the time in which they live. So my point is then we can't read that verse for itself. We've read it as a great apostasy verse, and then we move on to the next concept in the lesson. Or it's a plan of salvation verse. Or it's a, you know, a restoration verse. I'm going, isn't it more? Can't, can't I be going through a restoration process as I contact my soul? Can't I be working out my own salvation? So th the notion is we cut ourselves from the deeper interior soul application, I think. I worry. Yeah, you know, the, 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 the latest book on this from the Maxwell Institute, it's called Ancient Christians, An Introduction for Latter-day Saints. It actually deals with exactly what you said, that we'll better be able to love our Christian brothers and sisters from antiquity through the Middle Ages to today, including today, by setting aside that, that false narrative. Yeah, that's right. Well, at least to understand the ways in which it may be false, uh, and as well as the ways in which it may be true, and we become we become discerning about these things, and we we it's kind of like critical thinking or critical uh, reading. Critical thinking to me is you are aware of your own thinking process. Some people think critical thinking is hard thinking. I think no, you know the ways in which you tend to reason, and you work on reasoning better or improving your reasoning. And so this is working on improving your reading by unlearning and adopting a spiritual approach uh, to the application of scripture. Yes. I really like what you said there. I, I'd never thought of critical thinking in quite that way. You, you called it a, a reading or a thinking or a reading because you can read critically, right? Where you're aware of your thinking. I think people might get the idea that critical re reading or critical thinking is somehow critical of the text itself, uh, whereas the, the critical part of actually applies to the reader, not the text. Correct. So I think that's, that's helpful to, for people that's who, me. who don't understand critical yeah. reading, what that means, critical thinking. Right. A critical thinker to me becomes aware of the strengths and the weaknesses of their own thinking. And they go, when I, when I think this way, maybe I'm doing a better, a better job of reading, but, but when I don't, you know, I may have these these uh, challenges and problems because of my own tendencies or when I when I read yeah so it's it's self-awareness to me maybe some blinders on right maybe those right. chapter headings are can be like blinders right yeah, I, the lens... I already know what this says because the chapter yes. heading told me even if I didn't read the chapter heading this time I either read it last time or it's the narrative that I get in church and th then that becomes all I can see that's is that what you're saying that's exactly what I'm saying, which is what Sufis mean by unlearning, is that you realize, oh, this lens is now become a set of blinders, right? It was a lens. It was a way of looking at this verse of scripture, according to whoever wrote the headings. And I may have my own, or I may go read the Peshitta, that's another lens. I may adopt several different lenses, but if I think that any one lens is the correct reading, then I run the risk of those lens becoming blinders. And if I, if I read the scriptures and all I do is see those narratives or those chapter headings, uh, I would probably suggest that the scriptures have lost the power to change us from within because we're not reading spiritually. We're reading according to those lenses, which can become blinders. I would put it this way. Seeing, we see not. Hearing, we hear not. Reading, we read not. I see what you did there. Yeah. So remember Jesus at one point, I think it's in Matthew 13. Uh, I've I'd probably have to revisit that's off the top of my head where he says of the, you know, they ask, why do you speak in parables? And he's saying, well, in pointing to his detractors, um, he says, well, seeing they see not, hearing they hear not, neither do they understand with their hearts. 
See, that's to me, Jesus saying, you got to understand with your heart. It's, it's one thing to understand what I'm saying according to the great apostasy narrative or according to the plan of salvation narrative or according to the chapter headings. But he's saying, you know, so seeing they see not, hearing they hear not, neither do they understand with their hearts. And I'm paraphrasing now, lest at any time seeing they should see and hearing they should hear and they should come to me and I should heal them. I'm also hearing that there that none of these lenses are really a problem. They're not wrong. They're just not right. They're not right or wrong, right? They're just a lens. And and when I think back to our last conversation, I can try on one of those lenses and maybe make some progress on the upward spiral, but then I have to be able to take that lens off and try on another lens to continue to make progress or make a better lens. Okay. As you learn to read with certain lenses, you learn how to use them better. You know, you learn what their strengths are and what their weaknesses might be. You become a, a lens crafter, right? In that sense, you become, and that, that's what the Sufi is saying about coming around that upward spile of spiritual development, this repentance in terms of tawab or turning back again to look at ourselves and examine. So this whole path is self-aware, or we would say self-critical. You know, that's really helpful, Sheikh, because if I think of earlier when we talked about a critical reading, I know how to do that because I'm a philosopher. Well, that's my academic reading, right? So now you're telling me I can be a critical reader as a Sufi, right? That my spiritual reading has to be critical in the sense that I have to be, be able to use, not only be aware of my lens, but be able to better use it. So I have to really know how I'm reading, and be intentional about how I'm reading. That's correct. In fact, as a Sufi, I would tell you, your lens is your soul. Mm. That, that is your lens, right? And we'll talk about another day why uh, the truth of your existence is your soul. In other words, that's, that's the quickened part of you, we talked about quickening last time, that can sense spiritual truths. It's like a resonating organ that resonates with truth. And so the, the soul and the heart, which are in Sufism close to each other, this, this secret place within us, that's the lens Sufis want above. And we'll use other lenses, but we want to get to that lens above all else. Now I can see why it's so important, that why there's this metaphor of polishing the lens of the soul so that I can see, so that I'm not seeing through a glass darkly, to use Paul's words, right? So that I can see face to face soul to soul that's exactly true and 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 as you know uh i i'm not fond of that king james version translation because the greek it is now we see unsolvable riddles enigma enigmas we see enigma in an esperon which is a mirror a, a mirror so it's not a dark glass it's not like stained glass you'll hear people talk about all this i'm going yeah it's too bad that that glass darkly should say we see riddles in a mirror or right. better yet in a mirror we see nothing but riddles now and that's why sufis say polishing the mirror of your heart right that, that our sufi practice wants to polish that mirror and ultimately exactly as you said we want to get past that mirror even that perf more perfect mirror of our heart we want to get into our soul and let that power of that scripture resonate and if we use other lenses they become blinders and that never happens and so that, that glass darkly that, that we get in King James is actually a looking glass. And so it is actually a mirror. And so it's actually, weren't they silver and they had to be polished? That's correct. Yeah. Silver, and so, I don't know saying, exactly if they're silver glass, but they did have to be polished. That's correct. They may have so been you're metal. you're saying they're metal, right? They're, probably the, the finer ones are silver and maybe there are lesser ones of lesser metals. But it sounds like, too, that we can get past even that. I hear you saying we can get past even that, and that's where we come face to face? That is correct. That is correct. The first coming to face to face for the Sufi is the, is the ultimate aim and achievement of annihilating the ego. So there's only our, our soul with our soul. When we perceive our soul with our soul, then we have come to face to face with our true self. Now, that's related to hub in some sense. I mean, th uh, there's another root, a word from the same root, right? Habab, right? And now we're talking about a goal, right? So there's so, something going on here with, that's with right. that word, yeah. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. And, and, and indeed, so then the second face-to-face -face is when we are in that situation, then we can come face-to-face -face with the divine. 
we come face to face with God. And why? We'll know him because we know ourself. We know our soul and our soul sees clearly now and our soul can see God. We're going to find this in all of Paul's discussions. So, so the path to God is an inner path. This goes Absolutely. back again to our discussion last time, and it's That's an right. upward spiral. That's right. And we can use an outward path to prepare us for the inward path. But if we make the outward path, the external, the exoteric, if we make that, make that our path, that can become blinders too because we think we've already achieved it. I'm already there. I'm doing whatever, whatever my checklist is or I'm doing whatever. I don't want to put those things down because having a checklist can be a very good thing. But if all we have is a checklist, then I, I think we risk the, you know, we don't fulfill the law. We just obey the law. And I think uh, Jesus would have something to say about that. So when we say we're, with these readings that we're going beyond mere moral readings, that doesn't mean that moral readings aren't useful and that the moral rules or guidelines aren't useful. It's just that they, they can only prepare us. And That's then probably we, a good way to put it. And then we have to, they're, prep, they're preparatory, and then we have, to go, we have to go another step. We have to go farther, right? Correct. And, and I, I would say, rather than preparatory, I would say they're a vehicle. It's like, you know, you can love your car and just sit in the door at, uh, from your front porch and polish it up and wax it and everything else. But, you know, you got to drive it at some point. And then the question is, well, where are you, where are you going? Mm. And, and, and so it's, I, 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 because preparatory to me means it has kind of this one function. But I'm saying it, it, that, that religious law and ethics can take us someplace. But if we adore them for the, if we love them, if we hub, right, if we love them, then I, I don't think we've, we love the path or the goal or the destination. We've, we just sit and look at our car and admire it and take pictures of it and selfies with it and post them on our social media accounts. And so, so they're pointing and we're staring at a finger instead of looking to see where it's pointing. Yeah, and, and then actually going to where it's pointing, right? right. It's like a finger with wheels. <laughs> Find out where it's pointing and, and get in there and drive. And so, then come follow me. That's what Jesus said, right? Yeah, because he went, he went there. So he said, you want to know something? Watch what I do. Not only what I say, but following me is, is an entirely uh, different kind of project. And again, as we go through this upward spiral of spiritual development, we should be able to return to the law and see in it the things our soul is ready to teach us in the law. In other words, to bring our soul into the law. Then we go through that spiral and elevate ourselves again, and we come back to the law. So we don't abandon these lenses of the law or of commandments or of apostasy. We don't abandon any of them. We, we learn to use them well or we polish them or we refine them. And we always say, let my soul use this lens for a minute. Let my soul see what it sees. Not the lens will teach me all. It's not a crystal ball. It's a lens that we look through, right? It's not, it doesn't predict the future or tell us, it has no you know, magical property to it in that, in that common sense of understanding it. But, but what it does, it becomes, then the lens gains a new power. Now that lens can have a more powerful vision because we've refined it and said, well, it's not about the Middle Ages being awful and terrible, the great apostasy. Wh wh those people didn't apostatize. They lived the religion that they were born into and, and understood. And many of them tried to live it well. They did their very best. But we go back, instead of looking at that history through a great apostasy lens, which really gives you, I'm sorry, I'm a professional historian, gives you exceptionally bad history. And unfortunately, Mormons have accepted exceptionally it's bad history of the Middle Ages, the so-called Dark Ages, because that lens has poisoned our view of those. Uh, in fact, we've been taught to use the lens that way. We were taught to see the Middle Ages as the evidence of apostasy. And, and I, don't, I just don't, st I don't think God functions that way. I'm going to punish someone 1,300 years later because of something, you know, that may have happened in the first or, sec first or second century. I'm not going to, you know, that's unjust. So we got to take that lens and say, what does it teach me maybe about this particular thing and not apply it to the entire universe? We become lens crafters and lens masters. I know in the new book from the Maxwell Institute, Ancient Christians, An Introduction for Latter-day Saints, there is the idea that, of course, the, the, that the priesthood maybe was taken from the earth or something like that, right? Rather than 
the, there was some pure Christianity that became somehow tainted or impure. Uh, specific things like this that are covered in what else? Uh, the, the, the restoration of the priesthood. So there is a restored church in some sense. It's just not, it's just not this idea that, that the, the, the restored church is as the ancient church, which I think anyone reading uh, the, the, the scriptures carefully can see that the church today isn't like the church then. Correct. Correct. I was just reading Acts 6 again, and, and it's not the same. Um, and that's fine. But, but maybe it's the same in uh, the source of its authority and things like that. And so, yeah, dude, we would just become more discerning. You know, again, in the book that I participate in, Taylor Petrie wrote a, a wonderful essay called Par uh, Purities and Parallels that makes that point. And Eric Dursteller, a, a history professor at BYU, did an excellent job of showing the sources for the history of the great apostasy and where they came from and, and why they're problematic, why they're not really very good history and how much we've learned about the beauty and wonder and spiritual nature of, of uh, the 12th and 13th centuries in Europe that we would have written off as dark age nonsense. And so, at any rate, it's all about that lens. So, yeah, standing apart covers that. Yeah, that reminds me of one of the things that I love about the new book from the Maxwell Institute of Ancient Christians, uh, An Introduction for Latter-day Saints, and that's because it actually includes, when you said beauty, right, it mm -hmm. includes art. Mm -hmm. from our earlier Christian brothers and sisters, whether medieval, ancient, beautiful art, oh, so yeah. to help us appreciate oh, yeah. uh, those brothers and sisters and right. their faith. That's These right. are our spiritual ancestors. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, it's true. It w and, and we should love them. And, and, and yet that doctrine can get in the way of our love. It can get in the way of our heart. It can and, get in the way of our soul. And it's easy to see how that can actually translate to the same problem with our Christian brothers and sisters of other sects or denominations That's right. today. Yep. Or any brother or sister <laughs> of any, any human brother or sister, ultimately. You're right. Sure, because but, we can map that narrative. You know, j they don't have the truth, right? Whereas, whereas we know that, that, well, we have scriptures that tell us that God has given truth to all peoples uh, at all times and all places. Second Nephi 29 right. comes, to, comes to mind. So, uh, yeah, John Taylor once said that the, the, of the wonderful and beautiful, I'm paraphrasing again, the things that were accomplished in this age of darkness, this Middle Ages, and he said, if, uh, in, he said, if these times, the times he lives in, if my time, I'm paraphrasing again, if my times are enlightened times, then may God grant me darkness. Yes. Right. Let me, let me go back to how they lived. I actually like how they lived spiritually better than how we're living today. And so, so I mean, we've had, we've had prophets and other people in, in our tradition that have, have, have tried to give us an alternate viewpoint. But in, in essence, the power of this bad medieval history, great apostasy, that lens has become so powerful, it overshadows the teachings of our own prophets to the contrary. It's just become so dominant that it's hard to hard to read anything else so um i really relate to that that well, i was going to say quote that paraphrase right uh, because it, it just because well first of all because i've actually looked into that past and and i love it right there is so i share that and i actually see as as he did that in in many ways it was better than the present when it comes to when it when it comes to this conversation right yeah, I think so. So um, let's go ahead then to the verse 3 now in the Peshitha. Um, but if any man love God, the same is known of him, right? And so, That's King James. Oh, King James, excuse me. I'm, here it is. But if any man loves Allah, I just want to, I'll pause, I'll come back to that word, Allah, which is the Aramaic for God. But if any man love Allah, from this he is known. And the he in the English translation of the Peshitha is capitalized to make sure we know that God is known by our loving God. Our loving God is the key. So knowledge is obtained, of God is obtained through love. That's, that's not a lens. That's, that's a mode of being. That's a soul mode. 
right? That's we're living right out of the center and depths of ourself, and it, and and so we're going to come back to love and these things. But uh, uh, you know, so I want to spend a minute. We, we'll spend a minute here on aloha here in a second. But uh, I see a couple of things. I'll, I want to just say something about aloha too. But I see. But if a man loves aloha, from this he is known. I see that the the pronoun is still ambiguous. It so is ambiguous. I'll, I'll but, be looking for help with that. Right. Well, they capitalized it here. I, you know, I I'd have to go back. I I can read Aramaic, and then I have to work and use a dictionary. I'm not. I don't claim specialization Arabic, Aramaic. I mean, but 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 I think that what that what the translator is trying to do is make sure that it's capitalized. But that may be that's an interpolation and an interpretation, isn't it? The Sufi the Sufi would say, but if a person loves Allah, from this he is known to himself. Or from this, she is known to herself. Oh, wait a minute. So, okay, I'm thinking of um, I'm thinking of a hadith, a saying of uh, the Prophet Muhammad, who, by the way, was called a prophet by both Parley P. Pratt mm-hmm. and is it George Albert Smith? It, no, no, it was his. I think uncle. It was George A. Smith, Elder George A. Smith. You're talking about the like 1853 conference when they reported on their journey to uh, Europe and they ended up I think in Turkey in Istanbul and they were praising uh, the morals and values of Islam in, in those speeches you can find them I think in Journal of Discourses that's but, right and in ahead. fact in, in in that in those speeches it's interesting because going back to the great apostasy narrative they I think you can read those speeches such that by the time you get the rise of Islam right that the prophet muhammad is actually a restorationist prophet that's how they that's how they talked about the prophet muhammad so the prophet muhammad said if if, this is a paraphrase too if any man would know himself or no sorry no god if if any if any man or woman right, right if anyone would know god then they have to get to know themselves. That meaning, and this is another problem with translation, right? Their soul, right? Self and soul are both the same word in Arabic, nafs, right? Which is like the Hebrew nefesh. So the other thing I saw here is Allah, right? So I know that for many people, I've heard it said that that Muslims worship a false god, the moon god, by the way. Uh, that's Allah is the moon god, something like that, right? Because Whereas, it, was, it was a lot in, in the ancient... Arabic before Muhammad's time, Allah was was a goddess, and and so that's where Allah became Allah. But I don't, I don't, I think that's a well. That doesn't make any sense that. because that's Allah right. is included in the Quran as as not God, right? As a false god. Okay, so Allah is the word, the Arabic word for God, and you can see here, right? It's the same mm-hmm. in uh, Aramaic. It sounds the same, and Allah is in the Old Testament in Arabic. Mm-hmm. It is in the New Testament in Arabic. It is in the Book of Mormon in Arabic. Correct. It is in the Doctrine and Covenants in Arabic. And it is right. in the Pearl of Great Price in Arabic because it's just God. And so I always told these people, you know, okay, so you worship, uh, well, if you're a Spanish speaker, I would say you worship Zeus, right? Because uh, Dios comes from, the correct pronunciation would be Zeus, right? right? So Dios, you worship Zeus. This is the argument, right? And so here we're just talking about God. If, so if I translate this, but if any man loves God, I'm not translating. I'm, I guess it's a translation. But if any man loves God, from this, he, meaning God, is known. So one exactly. knows God by loving God is the bottom line. That's right? exactly right. That's exa- And that's exactly what P- Paul is saying here. This is why Sufis, as a Sufi, I would read this verse of Paul and I go, Paul's a Sufi. And of course, I don't mean that literally, but but what I'm saying is he's worried about his soul and its understanding and its knowledge. And so once I read this, then he begins to make a whole lot more sense to me because I'm not trying to derive a doctrine out of this for everybody to agree on a particular way of seeing it. This is the correct lens. I'm just going, oh, I'm like Paul. He's trying to figure this out. He thought the law was everything. And then the road to Damascus just bumped him completely off that track i mean wildly off his life track and now he's trying to reorient himself what does this mean well is the law valueless is the law have value or merit if so what is that merit what does it mean to know god well i thought i knew but it turns out i didn't 
And uh, I think this is common of all of us. In other words, he had a, he had a, a near catastrophic faith crisis. As a Pharisee, he had a total faith crisis. His Pharisaism ran smack dab into his experience on, va- on the road to Damascus, and he had to change. He couldn't stay in the Pharisee camp anymore. But then he goes, was my whole life pointless? This is, this is one way to read everything Paul is saying. What do I do with all this I learned about the law? And his phrase for it is, is the law, you know, therefore void? He'll say, God forbid. So it's not void, but then what is its use? It just has to be better understood is what he's saying. So if I go back to this verse, but if if someone loves, I'm giving a paraphrase now. This is verse three again. If someone loves God, then that's how they'll know God. That's correct. And so it occurs to me, you know, I know that our Sufi brothers, the poets uh, like Rumi, right? The 13th right. century uh, Persian mystic poet Sufi, right? It speaks of God as the beloved. So did his predecessor, exactly. Ibn al-Arabi, right? Yes. The beloved with a capital B. You see it left and right in the poems that, that, yes. that they wrote. In, right. in English translation, of course. But it's it, we're dealing here with this mahabba, right? This, Correct. Th- this love, this hub. Yep, that's exactly right. So, at any rate, uh, on with, you know, I, one of the things I just, I'll say this in closing uh, on this subject of Allah. Um, I love the Arabic sacrament prayer. Uh, when my wife and I were living in Egypt, uh, we would go to ser- some of our services were in Arabic. Mostly the branch there mostly meets in, in English because it's mostly expats. But uh, I remember um, the sacrament prayer in Arabic, and it begins with Allahum, uh, Allahum, which for me, and my interpretation of it is that's Elohim, Allahum, God of them, God of them all. Allahum a o o Allahum a, and uh, there's other ways to interpret that. But if, if a man loves Elohim, if a man loves Allah, or Allaha, or Eloh in Hebrew, El Eloh Elohim, Allaha, or Allahum, then that's how you know. I think that's what that verse is saying. And so it breaks us away from the idea of God I- is this particular thing, this lens that is is one thing and it's instead the language begins to break us open and say uh what is the divine and just in passing when i talk you'll often hear me distinguish the divine from the beloved for me the divine is god as god the 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 sacred as sacred the totality as totality and the beloved is the divine as manifestation emmanuel god with us right not not god in a self-contained truth, un, un, you know, uh, unknowable in, 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 in ultimate sense and uh, indivisible and those sorts of things. But uh, you read a bunch of that in DNC, especially DNC 93 or 88. So the idea is where are we going to know that? Well, you're not going to find Allah. You're not going to find the divine in a book because you can't write a book about the divine. The language ruins it. You can write a book about the beloved, but you can only know the divine through love, your soul. Your soul is the organ of knowing it. Okay, so at any rate, I think we've revisited a lot of, of those terms. And you mentioned hub, which I often think of as love or affection, adoration, and habab, as you brought up, which is the end or the goal. In other words, the goal is Allaha, the goal is God, the divine, and the, and the method of approaching the divine is love. Now I know that in the in the Arabic, hub and habab are related, right? They come from the same root, and it makes sense, right? If if I have love for God, then God is my goal. Uh, any beloved is my goal. I want to be with my beloved. That's right. So you want to know what the scary thing is? Go back now and read the Song of Solomon and see what it tells you. Okay. Right, because. You know, I, my favorite thing is sitting in LDS congregations or whatever, and everybody says, oh, yeah, well, Song of Solomon, you know. Someone said, we should just take that out of the Bible. I knew someone who actually cut it out of their Bible because it's, it's pornographic or something, you know, and I'm going, since when is the use of the word breast pornographic, except to someone who has a pornographic mind, I suppose. Um, but at any rate, it was, I just said, no, it's, it's ancient Near Eastern love metaphor poetry for God. And Much like Sufi poetry. Absolutely. And Rumi, you know, Rumi's the best-selling poet in America today, he, which is he, 
Which is ironic, isn't it? A 13th century Muslim. Best yeah, Sufi, poet in Sufi Muslim. Today. Yeah. Right. Yep, yep, founder of the Whirling Dervishes. So, yeah, and you'll find it in many other po poets, uh, Husro or Hafiz or Sufi poets are all about this idea of the beloved and love. So I wanted to shift to some Sufi terms which are expressed in Arabic. And at first we could say, well, why bother with all the Arabic? I don't understand it and I don't get it. And some of my Sufi students, when they begin, if they don't know anything about Arabic, will say, can I just use the English? And I'll go, yeah, but you're going you're gonna to cut yourself off from a, 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 com a vast thousands of books, Sufi tradition. Because when you read them, you're not going to know what the terms are. But even more importantly, Arabic is a language of nuance, as you know. Semitic languages are, they have depth to them that, like I say, English is a, a flat scriptural language. Arabic, not so. So I want to go to these Arabic words, and I'll explain them. You know Arabic, so you and I can converse on this. But there's a real lesson in this. So I want our listeners to know I'm just not saying, you know, this is, this is uh, you got to learn Arabic. I'm going to show them why I think getting into another language, getting into, is another lens. It's another lens that helps us to deepen our, our knowledge. Yeah, I see a couple of things, and that, that was the third one. I'll just go to that one first, that if you give me this new term to work with, then I can use it as a new lens, right? Uh, secondly, to, your, to, to one of your other points, you have, the Arabic has so much nuance. You, you have one word. People think it's hard to learn Arabic because they see the, the alphabet, and they, they can't, I can't possibly read that. I taught my wife the Arabic alphabet on a napkin over dinner once, and she was able to read. She didn't know what she was reading. Actually, she, she read a sign in Syria that said supermarket, right? <laughs> it, was, it was an English word written <laughs> in Arabic script, and she was able to read it, right? So that's not the problem. The problem is that you have one word, and it can have 50 meanings. Yes. And then you also have 50 words that have the same meaning sometimes, and then you have a vast lexicon, so many words, and that's part yes. of the nuance. Part of the nuance comes from all the words that there are, the vast lexicon, and part of it comes from one word can have 50 different meanings, so there's shades of meanings. There's what, what we call lexical range, right? Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that I see, I actually forgot the other thing that I saw. Well, that's okay, it'll probably come back. So I want to work with the Arabic root that has three letters to it. Hebrew also has a lot of three-letter roots. They're called triliteral roots, from which many words can spring by playing around with that same three-letter three letter order. And the letters are ra, ha, ma. And, and so the three words I'm going to work with are raham, rahman, and rahim. So rahama is in all of them. Rahman, raham, rahman, rahim. And let's just go through and kind of play with those words for just a second. It might help if we mention that we could represent this in our own alphabet, RHM. Correct. Does that help? RHM. And then we, we change the vowels as we go through this root and pattern system, right? Raham, Rahman, Rahim. That's correct. One is R-A-H-M, one is R-A-H-M-A-N, one is R-A-H-I-M. And they're all different words, but they're all R-A-H-M. Uh, derived, and, and right? That's correct. They're all the derived. Root. And so once we understand that root, that flavor of that root goes through all of these other words, nouns, and, and many other forms of, 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 of words. And so you get a real richness with it. Now, here's the I reason. I think I know where you're going with this. I can see. Well, I think, you know, because um, Raham is a womb. Correct. And in, you know, in the, in the Quranic, all the Quranic surahs, chapters, uh, they begin, well, but maybe one or two, there's some exceptions. They begin with Bismillah rahman rahim in the name of God, or the name of Allah. Yes, in the name of Allah, uh, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. And so there, he's being described as these two things, Rahman, rahman and rahim Good. Let's talk about this for a second then. In order to understand love as a Sufi understands love, we have to distinguish between two ways of, of understanding. Sufis will distinguish between the essence of a thing and the manifestation of a thing. And the essence of a thing is the self-contained reality of something, of a quality, such as love. And then we would talk about love as a manifestation would be hugging someone or telling someone you love them 
or praying to God as a, as a way of uh, expressing devotion and adoration. Now, I'm going to pause for just a minute here because understanding essence and manifestation is essential to understanding mysticism in, in just about every religion and uh, or every, every way it's been expressed, religion or not, is understanding it and understanding what's being said in Paul and what's being said in Scripture. So let's pause for just a minute with this raham uh, uh, word and womb. see womb uh-huh, and, and rahman and rahim, it, uh, its derivations, rahma, and we're going to look at it as essence and manifestation. Now let me just pause for a second and say, my soul can't be, can't be known, its essence can't be known if I say it's big, the moment I said big, I became comparative. Big as to what? Right? Even if I say uh, God has a body, I read in a verse where it says, but it's immortal and glorified, paraphrasing again. And I'm going, well, what is immortal? I don't know immortal. Everything I see dies. Immortal and glorified, uh, what does that mean? I, I don't understand what you mean by glorified. And so uh, we try to talk about the essence of of this issue, but we keep comparing it. Glorified as to what? The glory of one is above the glory of another. And you go, well, what is, it doesn't answer the question, what is glory itself? Okay, because that's only known through experience. In other words, Joseph Smith in the first vision account knew something of the glory of God that I will never know by merely reading it. He experienced it, therefore he has something to say about it. And even though I read about it, I, I, I'm still, I'm only imagining what it must have been like. I'm not there, and I didn't experience So, So the essence of something has to be experienced. It's the only way to know it. Okay. By the way, that which Joseph Smith experienced, he, he can, he does have something to say about it, and he does. And he says it in different words on different occasions and in different contexts, partly, I think, because you can't actually put that experience into words, no matter how many times you try no matter how many words you have you just cannot put it into words is is his glory brighter than the sun at noonday or is his glory uh, a fire that doesn't consume i mean these are all the different ways that joseph smith tried to find language that's another reason why when i talk about joseph smith my sufi friends and tell them that first vision account they go he's a mystic right i mean they think he's a sufi right away because they go oh that's sufi talk uh, where you realize your words are not, your words aren't going to get you there. You need the experience of it. So if you really want to know what Joseph Smith experienced, you have to have an experience like that. It's the same thing of saying uh, Lehi's dream and Nehi, Nephi's vision. Like, you know, if Nephi, he said he really wanted to know what his father was talking about, well, the angel gives him a vision. It's different, but he's now got insight because they share experience. Or DNC, I think it's 58, but I, or 50 or 50. Anyway, when you, one speaks by the Spirit, one teaches by the Spirit, both are built up both are edified so it's it's a, a, a essential realm not a manifested realm an experiential realm i think it's telling that nephi has his own experience so a couple of things stand out in the story you told so lehi has a dream his son nephi wants to understand it he asks for understanding he, he could have asked his father on earth right not his father in heaven even though the experience his father had was of his father in heaven right so he doesn't do that necessarily. If he does, all his father could do is give him words. That's not well, an experience. He'd already done that. He'd already done that. He already right. told him the dream. So he could have asked his father for more words. And no matter how many words or explanations or versions of the, of the story that he gave his son, he still wouldn't have his own experience. And so then he goes and asks God for his own experience, and he gets an experience that's very much his own. It's not the same experience. That's, that's exactly interesting right. to me. That's exactly right. And that, that's, that's uh, to me, we talk about that a lot. We say, you want to know the Book of Mormon's truth, then go have a spiritual experience. Pray, right? And ask about its veracity. And so, I mean, many times in our own scripture, God will just basically say, you want to know this? Go have an experience of it. I, I could talk to you about it through 84 more volumes of it. We could have scripture that would fill all the libraries of the earth. And it still wouldn't tell you what the experience will tell you. And, and so the essence of something can only be known by the experience of it. So if we want to know God's love, we have to experience God's love. Otherwise, it's just talk about God's love. It's not God's love. It's just chit-chat. Doesn't this same 
Prophet Joseph Smith were saying is a mystic. He certainly looks like a mystic. He's having an experience that's ineffable. Mysticism, mystic comes from mustis, which means to close the mouth, means something that cannot be said or maybe should not be said. If, if you go to the in the mystery cult and you go to you have the, the initiation as we have an initiation in our temple, you're not supposed to talk about it, right? So either you can't say it because it's an experience that can't be put into words or you're not supposed to say it. And so here this very mystic, this Joseph Smith that has this experience. I completely forgot what I was writing. Yeah, you were going to probably talk about. <laughs> I think where you were going with this is that he's trying to place that back into words. But maybe that's not where you're headed with it. That, that, but we recognize that's what's going on with him. So he knows something about God that I don't know because I haven't had that experience. Do you see what I'm saying? And so that's the essence of testifying is where you go, I know something because I've experienced something. And you try to explain it, and sometimes it sounds silly to us. That's not a testimony. That's a travel log. And I'm going, what's wrong with a travel log as a testimony? Well, I don't get why that's not a testimony. Why, if you only say certain words, it's a testimony. I'm going, if they felt God's love in that moment, why is that not a testimony? If you would know God, you must experience God. Isn't that what I said about John? That's right. right. If you would know God, you've got to conocer him. Experience the divine, I should say. Yeah. So let me go back to our words now for a second. I want to talk about essence and manifestation. So God's love always exists and has always existed in its pure form. But we each experience it differently, and it's manifested differently in the world. And now we go to a famous Hadith Qudsi, it's called in this tradition, or a holy saying, which the voice of the divine is speaking, says, I was a hidden treasure and loved to be known. Right? That hub word is in there. I love to be known, therefore I created. In other words, the divine said, I wanted to be known. I was self-contained within myself, but that wasn't enough. I wanted to, I also wanted to be known, so I created this so that we could know the divine. And so that's the manifestation, is the creation. The essence of God's love was always there. But creation is the manifestation, right? Because God causes his rain to fall on the just and the unjust. He loves us all. And so this creation has oxygen and water and light and and food and you know we can go on and on with everything that has been given as a gift of love so that's the manifestation well that a manifestation it sounds like it includes me so i am a manifestation of god's love and now it makes sense why i would be able to get to the essence through the manifestation right i could get to know myself and then that would lead me to a knowledge of god and your soul is your essence right it has always existed and putting it into this realm of mortality is a manifestation. So we could say my body is a manifestation of my soul. My actions are a manifestation of my soul. My choices are a manifestation of my soul. All these things are manifestations of my soul. With, and if my soul is a uh, bec a learns to love corruption, then my acts will be the acts of corruption. My speech will be the speech of corruption. So the fixing of it isn't by coming up with 680 some odd rabbinical rules. This might be a good starting point. The fixing of it is to fix your soul. So what does this have to do with Raham, with womb? And, and, and what do we do with, are we going to say that Rahman and Rahim, they mean something like essence and manifestation? And then how, do that, how does that, which one is which and how does that relate to a womb? Raham, the womb, is, is what I tend to call something like the eternal gestational realm. It's mm. the place of all potentials and all possibilities everything it's the quantum singularity of existence right i'm writing that down Exter the eternal gestational realm the womb the womb that, not the womb of god but the womb that that god is yes that's right that's right the fir the f the great essence of which i am also an essence right and we talk we'll talk about the soul in more detail another day i can't help but think of the divine feminine when when you say womb and especially if i say the womb that god is does that fit in this conversation sure because as a sufi i don't distinguish between feminine and masculine 
in, in talking about essence. Es if you say essence is masculine or essence is feminine, that's manifestation. Those are manifestations. That's right. Essence, essence doesn't have those sorts of qualities. And that's so right. all, all things we would call masculine and all things that we would call feminine, for me, are in my soul and are also in God's soul, so to speak. They're also in God, in the divine. And so uh, we would talk about things that we might say are masculine or feminine, we would talk about those as manifestations. But, but they all come from the same origin point, which is the essence. So the other one is, I would say, the soul's unknowable sphere of origin. So it's not only the divine's, uh, you know, uh, the divine, but it's also my soul. And what's happening is my soul has been awoken by the divine and put into a realm where I can now learn about my soul. That's the, the pl what we would call the plan of salvation is ultimately the plan of self-knowledge uh, uh, and uh, uh, as of my essence and to purify my soul, to, to act in purity with the characteristics of the divine. And then I, I become like the divine because I am the divine. My soul has the same characteristics as the divine has. So if I perfect myself and purge ego... And when I say perfect myself, I don't mean doing it alone by any means whatsoever. It's all done in connection with the divine. The divine teaches me. This is Sufi meditation and practice. I get in touch with my soul, and I, I seek the divine within my soul. I seek to, to have that, that connection and polish the mirror of my heart. And so uh, it's, it's, a <coughs> it's a connection, right? If I want to know God, I have to know myself. Okay, so then Rahman is it means love f from this womb sense but as a sufi i think of this as the essence of love or love itself love as pure potential or love unmanifested it's just love and how do you know it you experience it you discover it in your own soul okay so it's it's a characteristic of both god and the, and my soul yes and your soul David, my experience tells me these terms, Rahman and Rahim, are often translated something like the merciful, the compassionate. And I've, I've seen translations where the same word is used both times and no distinction is made. The merciful, the compassionate. Do, do mercy and compassion, they are synonyms. So I can see where it's not that different from using the same word, right? It, do they map in any way to essence and manifestation? Are they good translations? Or are we beyond that? Are we into a different kind of conversation? Yeah, we're having a different kind of conversation. Okay. If I were to say, I think there is a difference. They're not synonymous, mercy and compassion. I would say mercy is where um, I, I give someone a meal. Compassion is where I learn who they are. I sit down with them at that meal and I learn who they are and I learn about them. And I let them know that I'm listening to them and I let them know that I care about what their story is. And I'm not, so mercy to me has a different quality than, than compassion and, and anyway. So I, but those are manifestations. Mercy and compassion are both manifestations. The, the Sufis who say Rahman is just love in its purity. Love Let is me try pure this potential. Let me try this on, Sheikh. So uh, if I say, what if I wanted to say Rahman is essence, Rahim is manifestation, and they are mercy and compassion? Without contradicting, I think I can say that using your analogy right that the what cause it where my mercy comes from is that's the essence right it's where where everything comes from is essence that's exactly and right. and what comes from wherever things come from what shows up that's the manifestation so in that way they map right yeah to yeah. mercy and compassion oh absolutely well okay. if yeah if you're if your mercy and compassion come from your your raham or your soul right then they're they're gestated in your soul that's the raham of your soul is this place where you you cultivate pure love you work on it that's why sufi meditation wants to go back into the soul because you need that that raham of yourself you need to become the womb of love the other thing i see is when i think of raham when i think of the womb and love our conversation is about god's love then I get this beautiful image of emwombment. I'm making up this word, right? That God's love, you know, we talk about embracing love, right? A love that embraces us, right? I can think of, of God's love as an enwombment, and that's that feels really safe and comfortable and, right? I mean, come on, I'm, I'm, I'm in the womb of God's love. That's Absolutely. really something. And, and, 
some of us have felt that sort of connection at times, and it's it has no words. And and of course, in that womb, I'm connected to God by an umbilical cord too, right? So if I I stretch that image and I'm nourished and fed, yeah, that's a really beautiful image. It is a beautiful one. I'm going to meditate on that one. That's a good one to meditate on. The name of Rahman Rahim. Those are great names to meditate on. And uh, so I'm going to read from a book that my master wrote, uh, part of, which is uh, called The Physicians of the Heart. It's available on online bookstores, Physicians of the Heart. And uh, my master, Shabda Khan, is, is one of the authors of that. It describes it this way. It says, Rahman might be imagined as the inner self of God an infinite container that is incredibly compassionate, kind, and tender. It is the sun of loving compassion that is endlessly shining. So the sun is the essence. In this case, the light is the manifestation, the warmth, the gift of light. It is the source of all. It is the gate that opens unto all God's qualities and an inner secret of each one. In other words, if you want to be, if you want to be honest, it's really love. Honesty is really love. You see, so uh, honesty isn't a set of actions. Honesty is a particular manifestation of love. You love the other person so much you wouldn't deceive them. You love your own soul enough that you wouldn't lie, and so you don't need a commandment not to lie. You're just going. I, I don't do it anymore because I've learned to love. And that brings us to 1 Corinthians. We're here talking about 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through 3, but that takes us all the way to the end of this week's reading to 1 Corinthians 13, where none of those things that I could have, right, really mean anything unless they come from love. Yeah, so so I guess the other thing I'd say then, Rahim is the manifestation, right? The manifestation of love. And we see that, and I've already talked about God creating so that we could be here and we could grow and we could develop. That's all love. Uh, I don't think that there is a better uh, discussion of that, uh, uh, one that's better than in John chapter three, right? Uh, For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. I think we think that, well, God wants to punish us. God wants to send certain people to hell and save other people because he likes some people and hates others. And I'm going, that scripture doesn't say that. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whoso believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the purpose. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. Think of how many times we create a God that hates. We, I hear it a lot of times coming from not only people around me at church or elsewhere and I don't know that they really have thought this through and maybe they haven't but but my point is they're talking about how God punishes people or you know whatever whatever it is they want to bring up the 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 group to jour to hate whether it be Muslims immigrants women or or if you lived in Jesus days it it was Samaritans uh, and women or whatever so my, my point is God loves that's why so so we we need to get that 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 is God's mode of manifestation is always love. And if we don't get the love in everything that God does, then I think then then I think we've we've missed it. But uh, I think it might go without saying, but God doesn't hate gays either, right? God loves no. gays. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we left them out. Okay, let's include them. I mean, my point is that's why I'm commanded to love. I'm not commanded to judge. I'm commanded to love because because I, it's godlike. That's it. It's the only thing I know. I can know how to do. I can't really know how to judge. I can judge for my own self and say, "This is you know, I don't smoke." I could say, uh, and I'm very glad I don't, frankly. And I think it's a gift to my parents that I was raised in an environment in which I never was never tempted to smoke. Uh, that's my se- myself. I do, but I don't hate people who do. But my point is. I tend to look at that as as a gift and a loving example of something so that 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 I I happen to be taught a way of what I think is is living better but that doesn't mean I have to hate everybody else just because I don't they don't agree with me. And and so any rate I think it's possible to love but not judge. Can I try to relate John 3:16 more to our to our conversation about these first verses of okay. So I just thought if God so loved the world Right, that part's clear, and now we get that anyone who believes in, you know, so he sent his son, and anyone who believes in him, meaning the son, right, 
um, should not perish, but, uh, but should have eternal life, right? Which is a quality of life, not a duration, right? Um, eternal is my name, right? This is a life in his name, right? A life in Christ. A Christ-like lo uh, life, love, why not love? Okay, so I'm thinking, okay, so it sounds like I just have to believe in him. And that doesn't really go with our conversation so far. So I, I'm thinking, you know, behind believe to, you know, pisteon, right? Which is the Greek. And I see that this is about trust. And then I immediately think of a relationship, right? Uh, love and, and trust and, and the, these are relational terms. Yep. If, Am I on to something? Yes, because it says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Or if you love me, believe in me. In other words, I think that the scriptures many times teach us that all of the things we would call faith and belief are all love. And trust is a really great way of describing that. Confidence, trust, fide, right, from the Latin of faith. I noticed, too, that it's not just, uh, the Bible's not just asking us to be faithful, which may be a better translation than faith of pistis right but also it speaks of god being faithful to us this is a relationship and it's it's lo love is at the heart of it there's no other purpose if there's another purpose this is all some sad joke i mean if god sent us here and said you have agency and if you don't do what i say i'm gonna i'm gonna punish you eternally or something you know and that's that's who i am and i'm going really and so your punishment isn't the punishment of love to help me grow your punishment is just you're going to punish me then why, why would I want to come here? What's the point in that, of having a God who does, is not love? So what I want to do now, real quick, I want to change over and just do something uh, in our closing minutes here. I want to go back in, and I want to take the King James what, verses 1 through 3 of, of 1 Corinthians 8 and do what I asked you to do last week, which is to paraphrase them in my own words now, after we've had our conversation. So I would say, verse 1, now it's touching things offered unto idols, etc. I would say, now concerning things that are external or things that we love falsely and have made idols after and we offer our love to them. We know that we all do this. We all have, so to speak, knowledge of these external things and we love them, right? And we sacrifice to them and we offer to them. Well, that knowledge puffs up. It makes me think I know something. It th makes me think I'm on the inside track of something that everybody else is too stupid or confused or mis misled to understand. But love builds me up. In other words, but if I love, I don't worry about those external analogies. If I, if I act from within, then I would rather build up people than puff up myself. I would rather build up the world around me and make it a better place to live than I would to uh, take that knowledge I may have of external things and turn it into a multi-billion dollar corporation with my head at the front of it. Because I'd say, well, well, hang on a second. I'm not saying corporations are evil or that, you know, that, that's an evil track. I'm just saying I might be far more inclined to, to be inclusive of people and loving of people and to build up a better world out of it than I would be to, to use it on my own idol, my own ego. I also heard, I, I thought I heard the possibility that something like that this knowledge that puffeth up and, and the way that you described it in your paraphrase, that it could be something like, and, and you see this in the Book of Mormon, right? Uh, in the Ramyamtam story. Oh, I'm so glad that I know, right? Those guys don't know, right? I, I know, but they don't know. And it's funny how as Latter-day Saints, we often take that story to be about those silly people who said that. And we don't notice... Sometimes we're the silly people who say that. We are all capable of that. I am very capable of that. And one thing that Sufi meditation and practice does for me is it tries to remind me to move off that track. You know, it's, it's a toughie. Uh, I, whenever I hear political discourse in America from any side, I don't care, just political discourse, I hear a lot of puffing up. Just a ton of it. Everybody's going to give you the inside track that the other person doesn't get because they're too stupid or they're because they're this or they're that. And I kind of just get really sick of it because I, I just I don't see the point. Love is a little better for me. So second verse, if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. In other words, if, if I think I really have got the world figured out. Uh, or God. Well, or God figured out. Yeah, theologically, God, man, the universe. If I think I've got any of these things figured out, 
then I don't know anything that I should know because I haven't been focusing on my soul. I've been focusing on externalities. So if I think that I know anything, that external knowledge, or know everything, even worse, that is ego-fed external knowledge, then I really don't know anything that I should know. In other words, I'm completely off the spiritual track. I think there are clear echoes to this reading of these verses, 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through 3, in chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I agree with that completely. And, and, and you know, we're, our next assignment doesn't include chapter 13, but and I think maybe that's for one of our future conversations. Perhaps we'll come back to 1 Corinthians 13, which I think is exceptionally powerful, but maybe make a point here. You know, if you look at our last conversation about 1 Corinthians 3, this conversation about 1 Corinthians 8, and now tying it to 1 Corinthians 13, you realize that Paul's been talking about knowledge and love the whole time. It's one letter. It's one letter. And We've divided it up into three weeks. And uh, we divided it into chapters. Letter. We divided it into That's weeks. Right. We divided it into wor- verses. We divided it into... But, but I think that one of the ways in which we fail to read and understand Paul is we don't realize you've got to take that thing as a whole piece. You can't, you can't say, well, 1 Corinthians 1 is this and 1 Corinthians 13 is that because it's, it's all of a piece. It occurs to me that when I've received letters from loved ones, including I was separated from my own mother by you know, by, by seas, you know, by, by a sea at least, you know, I was in South America, she was in North America, and no, I was in North America, and she was in South America, and she wrote to me, and I never once only read one third of her letter, and put it away for a week, and then read the next third, uh, the next week, and the last third, the following week, I was eager to, to read the whole letter all at once. Yeah, I, there's, there's, yeah, because it's all of a piece. It's, it's your mother's love. Everything in it is your mother's love. And then, and then there were girlfriends too. I, I certainly didn't wait to read their whole letter any more than my mother's. Right? These are loved ones. Yeah, that's right. You want you want to be with them in that letter as much as you can. Yeah. So the third verse. Uh, but if men, any man love God, the same is known for of hi- of him. That's true. And then in the Aramaic. He knows God. So he is known of God and he knows God, depending on what you want to take. The King James is God knows the person who loves God. Or if you want to take the Aramaic, which seems to me to be reading that the person who loves God knows God. But to the Sufi, they're the same thing. Okay, so clearly the we didn't solve the grammar problem, right? The, the pronoun really is ambiguous. And yet the reading we came up with out of that is it goes both ways. That's right. That's why Sufis aren't troubled by ambiguities too much, mm. right? Because w- it, what the text says is not nearly as important as to what the text reveals to my soul. That's a spiritual read, Th- w- right? We treat scriptures more like wisdom texts, meaning this, that they contain the things I need for myself to, to progress on my spiritual path. Not that my way of interpreting them is the only way or, or that a per- particular person's way of interpreting is the only way. We've all been exposed to, well, uh, you know, I actually had one person when we were having a discussion say, yeah, but your quotes are from 270s and mine's from an apostle. Oh, well, you know, then what those 70s said shouldn't be taken. We shouldn't listen to that one because you prefer the apostolic utterance. And I go, you know, I, I just look at that. And I remember my, phys- my physicist friend, and I'll probably say this in almost every podcast where he said for every Brigham Young statement, there's an equal and opposite Brigham Young statement. In other words, I'm going, yeah, but that same apostle said something different on another day. So, you know, look, let's just take him as wisdom and apply them to our soul. Let's not just be so obsessed with this notion that we have, I have to agree with the words you use for it and I can't use my words. So now let's, I want to do one last thing. I have oh, to say that reminded me of, of a poker game. You know, wh- wh- what are we saying here? Two, one apostle trumps two seventies or yeah, something? Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's like, really, that's, that's what this has become. Okay. So I think we've learned about the way to control my manifestation is to purify my soul. And to it, control my manifestation? Well, or to direct my manifestation. That's a better way. To direct or to, to the, way, the best way for me to manifest in my life is that it comes from a purified soul. Oh, I see. And so commandments can help me do that. Scriptural text can help me do that. But ultimately, I have to cultivate the raham within my soul. 
and have Rahim and Rahman and Rahim. I need to become David, the merciful, the compassionate. You need to become Christopher, the merciful, the compassionate. And then the commandments are, you go, be, you go, you go, you fulfill the commandments. They, they take on the meaning that they were intended to have, as Jesus would put it. They, they don't just take on a legalistic narrow definition. So I just wanted to say, essence of manifestation, very important. The pure love you develop within, you have within, and that you release becomes the pure love manifested. And it manifests differently to different people. If, if you have children, you know this, that they're different, and sometimes you have to love one child in one way that you have to love the other child in a different way. And that doesn't mean you don't love them both. But they're going to say, well, you're not fair, you're not equal, and I'm going to say, yeah, because you're not equal. So this is how I see it, because that's how I love. Well, Abdul Haq, whose name means a servant or a slave of the ultimate truth. It means a servant of the essence, the servants, a servant of the pure divine. Abdul Haq, hopefully you have had a, an opportunity here with me and uh, to, to learn more about what Paul might be saying from a spiritual sense. I hope you've had the opportunity to ponder in your heart and in your soul things that you can now take to your Sufi practice this week. You've already indicated that. And begin to, begin to differentiate between your actions of ego and your actions of love and continue to polish the mirror of your heart and, and uh, learn to love the divine by loving your own essence, your purity of your essence, and loving all those who are around you. Okay, until next week, my friend. Amen. I look forward to our next conversation. Thank you for listening to Latter-day Contemplation Presents Come Follow Me. Once again, I'm your co-host, Christopher Hurtado. Please also consider listening to Latter-day Peace Studies' other podcasts I co-host, Latter-day Contemplation, offering a contemplative approach to discipleship, and Latter-day Peace Studies presents Come Follow Me, offering nonviolent historical critical exegesis of Latter-day Saint scripture at www.latterdaypeacestudies.org. Once again, I'm Dr. David Peck. Please also consider listening to my other podcast of Saints and Sufis, Musings of a Mormon Mystic, offering Sufi meditations and commentary through my The Truth of Jesus is Himself series at www.daviddpeck.com. Thank you for co-hosting this podcast with me, Sheikh Daoud. Thanks also to Latter-day Peace Studies all-volunteer team for editing, publishing, and promoting this podcast on social media. Finally, thanks to our audience for listening and responding to this podcast and for donating to Latter-day Peace Studies, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. All of your donations are tax deductible and go toward producing, publishing, and distributing content. And thank you for co-hosting this podcast with me, Abdelhaq. Till next week.